I got the job at United in the uh, late 2000. I started, I believe it was actually the first day of class was uh, uh, someday in December of 2000. I am um, work for American Airlines as a dispatcher. I've been dispatching for about 20 years, worked for the company 25. In the summer of 2001, uh, I was a flight dispatcher for United Airlines. Um, I worked primarily the international desks. Um, doing the Atlantic flights to Europe. Uh, it was a good time. It was very uh, uh, exciting times because uh, the dispatchers had just landed uh, the new contract. The dispatchers had just gotten a new contract, a very rich contract. The pilots had a new contract, a very rich contract. They were happy. I remember um, a, a piano player on a grand piano in the employee cafeteria uh, down in the um, in, in, in the employee cafeteria playing music during lunchtime. Uh, we were the largest international carrier in the world. Um, and uh, I think our only challenges at the time were to deal with uh, the growth. How were we going to manage the growth? After, uh, after a long, hard summer of thunderstorms and all that, you know, uh, most of us dispatchers enjoy the the fall because the weather is better, more stable. I remember getting signed off in April or May of 2001 and my sign off day was uh, one of those days where it was so busy because of kind of that spring early summer thunderstorms and uh, the examiner he had maybe two or three questions he was able to get in because it was just eight hours of pure diversions, reroutes. Monday September 10th, uh, I believe it was just a, a normal day in the life of a dispatcher. Um, I know that I was preparing for the following day uh, to be my first uh, official meeting as a union uh, board member uh, to go over vacation bid packages for the dispatchers. Um, I just remember uh, it was a good Good time uh, weather-wise, uh, nothing else was going on. Went to work, came home, and uh, was with the family and just prepared to go to work uh, the next day. So the day before 9-11, I actually resigned from management, and I went into my director, Hank Krakowski, and I told him that I was going to go back, and the dispatch bid was uh, due that day and I planned to bid a dispatch opening there. Uh, what had happened was uh, there was a turnover, in the, a complete turnover of the dispatch management team. And, uh, and I was offered a, a management job, but I wasn't real comfortable with the new team. And quite frankly, I missed dispatching and I wanted to go back and do it again. We had been at odds with the company for quite a while. Uh, like, and we finally got a contract that I think, oh, I, I don't recall, it's probably five years, maybe longer, since we had had one. And uh, so we were all thrilled that we finally got a contract, and it was a good one. And then 9-11 happened. The weather was, was just beautiful. Uh, it was uh, just a crisp, beautiful day in Chicago. Uh, in fact, uh, I believe it was VFR throughout the country. It was one of those days where the dispatcher were kicking, kicking back and and, and reading newspapers and and it was just a glorious day it was a wonderful day I just remember that feeling of finally being able to catch my breath and then actually taking a few moments and talking about Monday Night Football from the night before and um, kind of just remember that night on that Monday Night Football Ed McCaffrey had a real bad leg, leg break and remember just talking about that in the morning I started my day um, at uh, seven o'clock in the morning and uh, beautiful drive to work. I live on the other side of O'Hare, so it's, uh, it's just kind of driving around the airport to get to the world headquarters there. And, um, y you know, y you don't realize it, but every, uh, I'm close enough to the airport where I hear the, the din, the, the rumble of the, the, the morning, and you smell a little bit of jet fuel, you know, exhaust because you're close, and it, I'm on the east side, so the prevailing winds, you know. So it's just a normal thing that you, you uh, kind of take for granted, so to speak. I arrived at work probably about 7 o'clock in the morning, maybe a little bit earlier than that. Um, our meeting began shortly thereafter uh, with um, 
the president of the union and then uh, two uh, reps from the company, uh, management representatives. And again, it was to go over the vacation uh, bid packages uh, for the dispatchers. I came in at 6 o'clock that morning, and based on what I had done the day before, I wasn't real involved in any particular projects. I went out and talked to some dispatchers. I uh, reviewed some notes uh, from some meetings that I had. Actually, yeah, we had a new hire class that uh, had started training, I think. I didn't have any on my side, but we worked in quads then and uh, all faced each other. And uh, there were two trainees on the opposite side of our quad that were in there. And yeah, we were just, it was a very quiet, beautiful morning, uh, the kinds we always look forward to. I was working, I think it was a seven to three shift. I had, um, I was on the Boston departures desk, um, but I only fed, um, the hubs for United on that desk. So I was doing, you know, the Boston area, um, Providence, Manchester, and I think it had some upstate New York too, Chicago, Denver, Dulles. Um, didn't do any of the long haul West Coast flights, but I definitely had the Boston departures desk. And um, if you got bad weather, that can be a really challenging desk, but I was like, I think I can manage this just because it's a finally a good weather day. Just another normal day, really. Get to work, um, go downstairs to the bistro, 1200, and uh, Got some breakfast with, I think I was with a couple people. I don't remember who I was with, but I was with a couple other guys. And I was sending my little good morning, you know, ATC wants you. And did probably three of those, I guess, maybe. And then um, my manager called and he said, you know, Peggy, have you talked to Flight 11? And I said, no, I have been trying to get a hold of him. He says, well, try, try to go through Air Inc. You know, there might have been a security breach. And so that's the first we had heard of it. And uh, so I called San Francisco Air Rink and they tried to raise them and they, uh, and then things got, were known that something was wrong. And uh, at that point, we, then we said, we knew that there was a hijacking is all we thought. A hijacking of the 70s or the 80s was how it was handled. And uh, so Americans' procedures is to isolate the flight so they took me off the desk with my, that one flight uh, 77 was also on that desk um, but they brought a new dispatcher in and then and we handled it like you know old school I guess of, of seeing well how far can you go with this much gas the the energy and the noise kind of started increasing quickly it it, it, it was kind of a you knew something was out there, but you wasn't quite sure. Something was happening. Um, you could see people kind of huddling and clustering and talking about it. When I actually saw the aircraft turn, that's when you, something was not right. And that's when you started getting that feeling in your pit of the stomach and, and thinking, okay, this could be a real hijacking. This isn't pretend. The moment that I figured out that something was really wrong and something was not normal, um, it, you know, as normal can be in the dispatch world, was one of the managers came to me and said, have you heard from flight 175? And I said, no, I said, that's not my flight. And he said, well, that's your Boston departures, aren't you? And I said, yeah. I said, but that's a transcon flight that's over on the other desk. Um, and at that exact moment, it, it became apparent that there was really, and you could see in his concern, you could see and hear in his voice uh, the seriousness of whatever it was that was going on. Um, started to see some messages, started to see some ACARS messages from flights saying they're in ground stopped, they're, uh, what's going on, you know, uh, some, you know, strange transmissions. I think I, I remember coming across the printer. I don't remember if it was uh, one of my flights or somebody else. Um, but I think that was the moment that the really came up to me and said, you know, there's something unusual. We came back upstairs and walked into the uh, uh, SOC there and the, we had one TV that was, um, that kind of was, it was small, you know, enough, the technology today, obviously, the 60s and all that stuff, we didn't have that then, so it was a, it was a pretty small TV, but it had the news on, and the news was um, showing a picture um, of the North Tower and the, where, where the uh, American flight had went in, you could see the smoke, but very early on, as far as um, nobody knew, you know, what we were looking at. One of the uh, 
equipment guys, the guys that they move equipment around and work with ATC, came over and he put his hand on my shoulder and he says, Piggy, don't, he says, they just flew it into the World Trade Center. And I was like, what? <laughs> and I just remember thinking, I, I, I chuckled. I said, you've got to be kidding. That is not so. Just confusion. It was like I was trying to rectify this type of activity in my mind and I didn't draw the, the terrorism conclusion right away. It took a little while to get there, that it was deliberately done. It, it was difficult to imagine someone actually deli deliberately doing that. It was, you know, you're thinking about, okay, uh, the, the pilots passed out or something like that. Uh, but, that, you know, maybe that was a minute of thought, maybe that was 10 seconds of thought. I really don't know, but of course, at that point in time, I was back out onto the dispatch floor and, uh, and talking to folks and trying to figure out exactly what we had going on. I don't know, I wouldn't say I was alarmed really yet. I mean, it was one of those, well, that's odd, you know, and um, you couldn't tell, um, it was kind of hard to tell on the TV if it was a small plane, big plane, you know, since we didn't see any footage of the airplane um, you know, going into the building, so you didn't know what size it was. And, and they were reporting a small plane. There was even thoughts that it might be a regional or a commuter. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> which seemed extremely odd because it was severe, clear. I w yeah, I was in shock. My, my husband was a dispatcher also, and he came over and, and uh, sat with me for a bit. And that was... Then, then it seemed like everything got a little chaotic in the office because we, everybody, we were getting such conflicting information that, you know, we there were two planes and, and it was probably about that time that we realized 77 was not uh, responding. We had an advantage over American Airlines in that we had Passer, and we knew uh, by looking at Passer what airplanes were flying around and which airplanes had actually uh, deviated from their flight plan. At one point in time, American Airlines called us thinking that the, their airplane that went into the Twin Towers was ours. And we said, no, we had you on, on Passer, and, and we believe it's yours. The first indication we received that something was wrong was uh, a page that uh, we got to uh, at the time. Uh, we had these small Blackberries, and uh, uh, both union and leadership had these these blackberries and the message that came across said um, uh, aircraft has struck the World Trade Center uh, more information to follow um, and and to 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 kind of frame up the situation um, uh, the the day prior um, our corporate security had uh, initiated uh, an emergency response exercise that nobody was aware of or nobody was prepared for. And uh, one of the United flights uh, that goes over the pole, um, a, a page came out close to the end of the day, about 5 o'clock, that said that that flight had experienced uh, an uncontained engine failure, uh, heavy casualties, uh, and uh, the flight was going down near the North Pole, somewhere up in the polar region. Uh, as you can imagine, a lot of folks uh, that were on the drive home uh, uh, turned their cars around and tried to get back to headquarters as quick as possible to deal with the emergency. A few minutes later, uh, another page came out saying that this was just a, just a drill. Um, so uh, it called everything off. So the morning of September 11th, we thought this was the same thing. Uh, we thought this was coming from corporate security just as another drill. Um, I recall looking at that and just kind of shook my head in disbelief. Uh, a couple of the guys in the room said, man, somebody's going to lose their job over this if they keep sending drill messages out like that. So we all cleared our, our pagers and, and literally went back to work. Um, it was a few minutes after that uh, when uh, the president of the union, um, Denny, uh, his wife actually called him. And uh, we could hear over the cell phone uh, her asking him if he was okay. And, and so, sure, we're, we're fine. Why do you ask? So she said that on the news, they, she was watching that uh, an aircraft had hit the World Trade Center. So at that point, we knew something was wrong, and then we went out to the dispatch floor to see what was going on. My husband and I went out in the stairwell and sat for a bit. And 
talked, and there were a couple of the vice presidents were around then. We started getting a lot of more activity, obviously. Um, and my husband encouraged me to get back up and to get in there and to see what else I could do, and because it, it was very obviously upsetting. I think I think that's the first time I I really understood how, the ownership of a flight. That you know you dispatch and you think okay you're moving some you know people A to B and that's the way it is. But I think that's I really recognized the ownership of that was my flight. And this horrible thing has happened to these people on, on my flight. So I got back to my desk and, you know, kind of, you, you go through your um, departures and what's coming up next and what, you know, kind of looking ahead at some things, um, realizing that something's going on. So kind of one eye up on that TV screen going, that's weird, you know, some other airline may have had a problem today. Um, but just sort of routine, I would say. When we got up and we walked out to the floor, uh, the first thing we saw on the, uh, the big overhead monitors was uh, CNN displaying uh, a big smoking hole in, in the first uh, trade center. Uh, I was astonished. Uh, I had expected a small, light aircraft to maybe have hit the building. Um, obviously, this wasn't the case. And so immediately, we went uh, to the bridge uh, to ask um, the uh, uh, MUFDO, or Manager Flight Dispatch Operations at the time, uh, we asked the MUFDO uh, if he had any information on this. He was actually on the phone with American Airlines' uh, dispatch center, and uh, they believed that it was an American jet that hit the, uh, the, the trade center. Uh, so while we gave him some breathing room, uh, we walked the floor just to see how everyone was doing. Uh, everybody was fixated on the, on the screens. Um, uh, it was shortly thereafter, as we were watching the coverage live, that we saw, um, uh, at, at the time we didn't realize it, but it was United 175, hit the second tower. Uh, and it, it, was, it was a moment of disbelief. Uh, there was a silence in the room, and then somebody said, that looked like one of ours. And immediately, uh, the dispatchers went to ACARSing their aircraft to ensure that all their aircraft were, were okay. When they said that they thought it was 175, so then everybody looks down at their sheet and Ed realizes, of course, that that's one of his flights. And uh, we, we have um, we have an aircraft situational display, an ASD that at the time um, would show, you know, kind of where things are at. It wasn't really as good as, as what we have today, um, but it did give us a pretty good idea. I mean, it, it, I think it pinged the airplane um, you know, like every five or ten minutes. So you didn't get that nice, uh, smooth track. You know, it just kind of sort of took pictures of the airplane, if you will, and or information that we got from ATC at the time, right? At the, about the same time, we heard from the MUFDO that um, the American jet that had hit the towers, uh, they believed that it was hijacked, that the crew was killed on that flight. Eventually, the thought process started coalescing amongst the dispatchers that we needed to do something about this that was out of the, you know, outside the box, so to speak, that was, a, you know, a tactical operation that we had never accomplished before, never even thought of having to do. So I began discussing this with some of the other dispatchers out there. And at the same time, another dispatcher had been coordinating with the chief of uh, dispatch, uh, the dispatch manager, who was Mike Barber, about a message to send up to the flight crew. So I, I saw that message and I wasn't particularly happy with it. So I worked with some of the other dispatchers to craft a different message. He drafted up or came up with, um, with any cars that's pretty famous. People have read it on plenty of websites and so forth, but you know, beware of cockpit intrusion. As the event picked up and took hold, uh, getting out the seriousness to the crews became my first priority. The ones that were airborne to me seemed to be the ones that were most at risk. The ones that, you know, had that threat where um, they could themselves be hijacked as well. Getting them the message to say, this is a big deal, this is serious, this is not a joke, this is not a test. There was a lot of chaos, a lot of confusion going on. Uh, and then as, as the events started to unfold, 
we were starting to get conflicting reports. Uh, by that time, uh, I believe it was American 77, uh, the American Airlines, uh, the second American Airlines jet had hit the Pentagon. Uh, so we were watching the coverage between the two jets that hit uh, the World Trade Center and then uh, the American Airlines jet in, at the Pentagon. Uh, and we're starting to piece together what's going on. When we had sent an ACARS, you'd get a response, and that response would come to your screen, um, so it would light up, and there was actually an audible beep, you know. And then it would also, at the same time, it would print off your uh, dot matrix printer. So the printer is going kind of nuts, if you will, right? All these replies are coming back, and it would so that's just sitting there with a pile of paper on it. Ed's screen was um, lit up as well um, because after it gets to a certain after the queue builds up with a cars okay it start it changes colors so it alerts you that there's more than I think it's five or something so so obviously he was busy and busy because you know he, he took the initiative to send out a message which was brilliant to get everybody to wake up hey there's something going on but uh, like you know it's a like I said, it was um, um, the, the message was alarmed to them, but it also confused them. I think at first, um, certainly. So um, we went through and accounted for everybody, right? And we get through the list, and you know, 175 hadn't replied, and I think Ed spent some time focusing on that, if I recall. I, I, um, I sort of was taking over the. These are the guys that are okay. We're talking to these guys. So um, he sort of shifted his focus more on that, thinking there was something more he could do, I think. Um, there was another flight on his desk that was also um, not responding, okay. There was an earlier ACARS that came from Flight 93. Flight 93 um, uh, took off. He made a note, uh, just a general communication back and forth with, uh, with the dispatcher about headwinds and uh, you know, kind of going to be a long day because, as I'd mentioned earlier, the, the winds were howling, you know, across the country. So, long day for those guys going to the West Coast and quick day going back. But anyway, so there was there was communication there. So we found that communication as we're going through the papers. Like, okay, so we're talking to this guy, right? I think we're talking to him, right? But hadn't got a response back on that second wave of communications. We we asked him to try and get a hold of Flight 93. Uh, because it had turned around, uh, so it was on a it, it was a westbound flight. It had turned around and was heading back to D.C. center. The airplane is headed towards Washington D.C., and the Pentagon had already been hit. And with this flight track, um, I guess the the air the, the military that had their head around what kind of was going on, basically that we're being attacked, and and so they're asking the airlines, "Are you talking to this, this, this?" and so obviously we weren't talking to him, but um, it was kind of assumed that um, they weren't going to let the airplane get to Washington, D.C. And, and damage the Capitol or the White House or the Pentagon again or any other, you know, major city. So um, Ed was frantically trying to get a hold of the flight via A cars to uh, um, get them to turn around, and there was no response. You know, there was maybe... A, there's maybe a whisper of hope in the back of your head that, you know, this whole thing's crazy. ATC's a mess. There's planes diverting everywhere. Maybe, you know, the Nordo thing, which is when they lose contact, you know, maybe they didn't, maybe they're not on the right frequency. So they're focusing on that. And why would they make the turn back? I, I don't know. Maybe they're, maybe they're deciding on their own that they're going to go land in Pittsburgh or something. So there's a, there's a whisper of hope, I guess, you know, in that regard. Um, Maybe the ACARS quit working. I mean, it's a machine. Things happen. Uh, Ed, I do recall sending up ACARS messages saying that uh, he would be shot, the flight would be shot down if it entered DC airspace. I sent a couple notes. I went over to my desk and sent a couple notes up to them. Um, you know, how's the weather? Uh, is there anything we can help you with? Um, my thinking there was, okay, so this, can, this cockpit intrusion a cars went up, and if the, if there is somebody in the cockpit, um, maybe they're you know. I'm, I'm assuming the pilots are flying, and I'm assuming that in my mind that 
maybe the, the terrorists were, um, maybe didn't notice. So if I send up a message that maybe they can reply to, like, how's the weather, they can say, we can tell them that it's fine or something, you know, and I was thinking that maybe we'd at least get a reply back, um, you know, from them if we sent something different. I mean, um, I guess at that point I assumed that they were already, something was going on and there was, because they're not replying, right? Everybody else is replying. And uh, shortly thereafter, he lost it off of his ASD. I found, a, I found an A cards in the paper, okay? So I'm just going through the paper and making marks and notes and so forth. And um, I found something in there that was a, a reply, similar to some of the other ones, you know, like a what or a please confirm last message, okay, which is what it was. Um, the message was sent out multiple times, so um, whether they received that message, I mean, they received it prior to the airplane being taken, I think, um, but the confusion was there and the timing was, I mean, that's, I guess that's, <clears throat> that's a, a moment that's pretty tough, you know. <clears throat> so, um, you know, of course, you'd, you'd think you probably could have saved them or something, but, you know, you're just doing your job, right? So, I mean, I think that what was done was, everything was done that was done, that could have been done, and it's just, uh, you know, looking back now, you know, the, the timing of it just, it just sucks, you know, it just, it sucks that, that it didn't, it didn't happen, you know, I, I think had we had five or ten more minutes, you know, and it's, it's nobody's fault, it's just the way, it, it's just what it is. On flight 93, as the, uh, the fight broke out, we had a, a system called uh, Starfix that allowed the flight attendants to send information down to maintenance control in San Francisco about things such as broken tray tables and stuff like that so they could get them fixed. And one of the flight attendants described the situation on board Flight 93, sent it down to maintenance control, but the OCC was so busy they never got that information. At, at some point, um, one of the managers came back and, and said that uh, they had confirmed that, you know, 93 had hit the, hit the ground. There was a, a little bit of stunned silence and um, just disbelief that we had lost another aircraft. Everybody in the room was in shock. Uh, we weren't any different than anybody else, you know, the whole room. I remember looking up at one point after this had all gone down and after we would got everything on the ground and, you know, I saw a few dispatchers that were in tears. It was just, you know, we, there was just no policy for something like this. That, you know, do we contact each and every flight and tell them what's happened? Or do we just continue on? Traditional, conventional wisdom of terrorism is they take the airplane and they land and make demands or something like this. Well, obviously you're dealing with an entirely different situation. That There was no, there was no negotiation, right? It was... They were, you know, they were, they were busing down a very weak door that had no lock on it, and and um, and, and, and murdering the crews, you know, and then to, and and having the ability um, to fly the airplane um, to their targets. On the bridge, uh, as we started to realize this this terrorist event was going on, uh, we 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 didn't know what to do. Um, I know from my, uh, from my perspective, I really felt helpless. I, I, I just didn't feel equipped to deal with the situation and know what to do. Uh, it was about that time that uh, one of the uh, dispatch managers who had gone back to the line, uh, Hubie Green, had come up to the bridge to get a better understanding of what was going on. Um, I recall that everybody on that bridge, uh, we all looked at Hubie, and, and uh, as he assessed the situation, I think there was a pause uh, as if to ask Hubie, what would you do in this situation? He, uh, he sat there for a, a reflective moment. He thought about it, uh, and then he said, We're putting everything on the ground, and he said, Do we really need to do that now? And I said, It's being done. The dispatchers are in the process of putting all the aircraft on the ground. So I, I helped in the determination of, of how we would do this, and 
the general guidelines were if you were within 45 minutes of your departure station, go ahead and go back. Uh, otherwise, pick the nearest suitable, but make sure that it's suitable for the customers as well. We don't just want to land on 10,000 foot runway and find that there's no terminal. Of course, that did happen to some flights. With Hubie's actions that day, uh, had he not made that call, um, I, I think without doubt, sooner or later, yes, the, the nation would have been ground stopped. But um, had he not made that call at that time, uh, there, there, we may have potentially have had another uh, uh, flight get hijacked. And I say this because uh, we had a flight out of JFK uh, that was in line to depart. And uh, through all this chaos and when we decided to ground the fleet, um, that flight, uh, amongst all the other ACARS messages, was told to go back to the gate. So uh, I recall the crew um, saying they had no hesitation to go back. Um, in fact, they decided they were going to call it a mechanical issue and um, got out of the line and started heading back to, uh, to the gate. A couple of things were, were going on. Um, as they were going back, the first class flight attendants called the cockpit and they said, um, we have a few passengers uh, up in first class who are, who are pretty upset that we're not going to depart. Can you, uh, do you have any more information on this? And the crew the flight crew said that uh, it was a mechanical issue and they were just going back. They didn't want to alarm anyone. And, uh, and the flight attendants called back and said, um, these passengers are now out of their seats demanding to talk to you as to why we're going back. And so uh, at that point, uh, the flight crew said that uh, we're not going to allow any access to the cockpit. Um, there was a little delay getting on a gate, uh, I'm sure for obvious reasons. I'm sure the station was preoccupied with uh, everything going on at the station. Ultimately, uh, when the aircraft got marshaled on and uh, they brought the jet bridge up, as soon as the door was open, uh, those individuals in first class and uh, a few individuals uh, back in economy uh, literally pushed the flight attendants to the floor and, uh, and, and ran off the aircraft. Uh, and uh, to this day, we don't know uh, where they are. Uh, but uh, when the FBI searched their luggage, uh, we knew that these guys were bad guys as well. They had the ties. Uh, they had the manuals. They had uh, the same type of uh, information that tied them to uh, the rest of the, the, the network that, that had hijacked the other aircraft. So uh, I, I really do believe uh, if that call, was, had that call been made, a few minutes later, that, that aircraft may have gotten in the air. And then that, that could have been a casualty of the day as well. That could have been our fifth casualty. Immediately, in my mind, it became apparent that there could be many more of these incidents occurring. Management had said, come back and put everything on the ground, OK? Um, and that was, so, so there's another level of accounting, right? OK, so now we've, we've alerted our crews, right, that we have some kind of serious issue and, you know, um, do something to protect yourself. And I just took, took actions and started doing that. I just jumped right into, you know, finding places, pulled the flight strips from everything that could have been departing, made sure that all the releases were pulled, flight strips so they couldn't, you know, couldn't depart, even if they had an opportunity to depart, uh, make sure they didn't depart, at least on my watch. Our ATC coordinator received a call from the command center, the ATC command center, and said, uh, and they had asked, United, are you grounding all your jets? And, uh, and we replied, yes, we are. We have no idea what's going on. We think it's a ter rolling terrorist event. We're putting them all on the ground. Uh, it was shortly thereafter that ATC put out the nationwide ground stop. Um, so uh, uh, I know what the history books say, but from where I sat on that morning on September 11th, uh, I truly believe that it was one man is Hubie Green who made that call for United Airlines uh, and for the rest of the industry that day. I had a plane and I think it left Rochester or Buffalo or had just passed over and had gone into Canadian airspace and was going to say just turn around and go back to Buffalo and Rochester and um, they weren't allowed back in the US. Okay now go to Toronto 
and he had cars back saying that the traffic demand was so high for Toronto that um, they were going into holding, uncertain of when they would be able to land, and they weren't even sure if Toronto would let them land. And at that moment, it became, okay, I need to find some place else for this flight. This is my flight. I'm responsible for it, so I need to find some place else for it to go. And I remember walking to the front in the classic use your, utilize your resources um, and went up to the front, and I, and I believe, again, it was, it was Hubie, and I told him this scenario, and he said, well, how about Hamilton and YHM? And I had never heard of Hamilton. Um, I've never been to Hamilton. But I recall um, going back to my desk, verifying that it was in the specs, looking at the um, length and widths, and it was, it was well within the capability for the airplane. Sent that to the crew, and they diverted to Hamilton. And um, it's one of those things that 15 years later, I still could tell you YHM and uh, talking to the crew when they got on the ground and you know, got some appreciation that they were able to get on the ground. Um, and, I, and I think it was that same crew that the, they told me that the first officer used to play football at Navy, at the Naval Academy. And once he got my messages, he actually pulled the crash axe out and had the crash axe in his lap um, as they were you know, doing all their preparation to get on the ground. We actually uh, had the flight crews pull the circuit breakers to the in-flight entertainment system uh, because we weren't sure if there were any bad guys on those flights and weren't sure that as the flights got closer to the U.S., if there would be some, some uh, event that might occur on those flights. It became apparent as we were diverting uh, partially along the route of flight that we were overloading some stations and some stations could handle more. So I tried to work my way back and forth to different dispatchers and tell them what, what other dispatchers were doing and, and tried to disperse the fleet as best we could within the capabilities of the stations that they were going to. We weren't always successful and an operation of that magnitude you can't expect to be but I think that that was that worked out pretty well for us there. That there was somebody that was able to say, hey, we've got three in Kansas City, uh, nobody's in Omaha right now, that kind of thing. Like it just wanted the continuing validation that my planes were on the ground. I didn't want another one to be go missing and have some uncertainty about what's happening with it. And, I, and it was, it's strange when I think back on it, but I had my sheet and I just kept going through and looking at them and verifying that they had um, in the gate times, in the gate times, in the gate times. And who did I talk to? And I had kept a, um, a, a note sheet of everybody that I had talked to, where planes were, um, what their status was. And I remember just continuing to review that um, and never even tried to call home to talk to anybody. It just, I think I was in such a focused dispatch mindset that I just stayed in there. But also listening to see where other people were and, and hearing if they, could, if they needed help. And I think that's, again, you know, one of those pieces that a dispatcher is all about, is you're going to help. You always help. It was surprisingly quick um, to, to land 2,000-plus aircraft, um, United Aircraft, uh, is, is a monumental task, especially when it was, it's not planned. Um, but I do believe it was surprisingly quick. Within, uh, I, I don't know what the official records are, but it seemed like within a matter of less than two hours or so, we had just about all the flights on the ground. You know, it's, a, it's kind of a blur, the day itself, you know. So it's at 7 o'clock, I'm, I'm eating, and it seems like this all, I think 93, you know, that whole thing was done at 9.30ish or something, 10 o'clock, you know, the, the certainty of what had happened there. By then, it's a, it was a weird calm and quiet in the office oddly quiet. I mean, there's no radio chatter. There was no phones ringing even. It was, it was a weird atmosphere. The unsung heroes were the dispatchers that were on the floor that began thinking about what was going on. All of us, this was new to every, every one of us. I stayed in the office till about five o'clock. Um, we had multiple flights internationally that we had um, even though all of our flights were grounded, um, little things like uh, in Buenos Aires, Argentina, our maintenance staff uh, towed uh, an aircraft from the gate to the hangar. Uh, that triggered an ACARS event, and we picked that up in dispatch. And, and uh, so for the next few tense minutes, we were trying to determine 
why was that aircraft moving? And then we found out it was being towed. I'm not sure who mentioned it, but Ed and I said, you, you know, we're going to walk away. We're just going to, we're going to take a walk, okay? Um, so we went down, <clears throat> I'll never forget, this was, this is one of the pieces of the day that sort of sticks with me. <clears throat> uh, we went downstairs, so we're on the third floor there. We uh, went downstairs, it was, again, a beautiful day, uh, and we went for a walk in the parking lot. The parking lot's kind of huge, because it was a campus, United headquarters there, so I think we took a 30 minute walk. We just, just kind of walked through the parking lot, walked all the way to one end and kind of down the back, just trying to get some fresh air. And in that whole period of time, neither one of us talked about what just happened. We talked about, you know, Ed's boat. We talked about, um, you know, kind of how I got to be here, you know, where, where, where I was before. But, um, and it wasn't by, it wasn't that I was afraid to talk about it. It just didn't happen, you know. I guess it was just your mind being overloaded with, with all that stuff. And um, so, and we got back upstairs and um, went through all this stuff. And, and uh, you know, uh, it just it, it, it kind of, I remember taking all the ACARS traffic and, and was, <laughs> the, the paper was, I don't know, it must have been 40 feet long, you know, this dot matrix paper and had all these notes scribbled on it and everything. And, and they said, well, you're going to need to, we made copies of everything so we could recollect it later, you know. Um, and then I took it all home and, um, you know, I still have it to this day, you know, in a folder. I've never looked at it. Um, I thought about it a couple times, but I just can't, so. The one thing that stands out in my mind about that drive home that I thought about later was I probably should not have driven myself home that day. I probably should have had somebody come get me or, you know, uh, go home with somebody or something like that. I just recall being in a kind of a fog, haze, um, didn't have any kind of chance to decompress after, you know, the day at the office. And and that reality is there for everybody, I think. I think all of us were just, you know, we did our job, you know, and you walked out, and you got in the car, and you went home. And I went home, I sat down there, and I looked at the TV, and I poured myself a scotch, and I was literally shaking from the emotion of the event that all of us as Americans feel, but also the additional emotions of losing the United Flight Crew, uh, for two aircraft, uh, the customers, and not knowing why all this had happened. I was able just to kind of get home and, and just kind of collapse in a way where my career, my job is completely changed forever. It will never be the same. Um, the company itself was going to be completely different um, in the coming days, weeks, months. Uh, we knew that there were going to be no flights for for several days at least, but the decision was made to still have the dispatchers show up to work. Uh, even if there was nothing to do, uh, we, we wanted them to uh, be in dispatch. We had to try to figure out how to get this airline back on track. Uh, when you think about it, a one day loss to an airline is the difference between profit and loss. And we needed to get the airline back up and running for an additional reason, and that's to prove that we could do that, that we could get the airline back up and running, that they weren't going to win. It took a long time because we, we didn't know where the airplanes were, we didn't know the crews were waited around as long as they could, and then they started renting cars and driving home. And uh, it, it took a long time to put the operation back together, and, and then nobody was flying. I mean, even at, once we did start flying, you know, people were afraid to fly. In, in the coming days, weeks, and months afterward, I remember just kind of a, a somewhat of a somber feeling. You know, you just, and I think it was because there was so much uncertain about it, you know, particularly in the coming days. You know, when's the, when are the airlines going to be allowed to fly again? What What is that world going to be like? What are we going to have to do? Um, you know, what does this mean to the country? What does this mean to just flying in general? And um, it was a really difficult time. And I think what for me was especially challenging is that 
Um, in that period, I had moved to Chicago within a year's time, moved to Chicago with a, a daughter that was about two years old, had just had a son that's about, uh, he was, you know, just a couple days, you know, a week or two old, um, and had a house, you know, all of the American dream, so to speak, and now you're third from the bottom in seniority, and you're wondering what's going to happen next. Um, and I think from a realistic perspective, I knew on September 11th that ultimately I was probably going to get laid off and let go. Yeah, there were, we were concerned, especially the junior people were concerned. And, and shortly thereafter, all of those new hires did, were laid off and lost their jobs. So that was very unfortunate. November 1st was my furlough day. You know, I remember getting the letters. I think the union tried to do what they could, but there's, you know, at some point it's, it's inevitable. And so, um, and it was funny is that uh, we had planned a trip to Disney World around Thanksgiving, and we ended up keeping that trip. And, you know, there was a lot of debate about it and whether to go or not go. And I think we just needed some kind of fun, some sort of not 9-11 but those flights were wide open. And so it was right then you knew even at Thanksgiving time there was wide open flights. It's not normal. So it even when you're trying to take a trip to escape, so to speak, it still hits you, you know, that you're going to, um, you know, get on an airplane that's nearly empty. So, uh, you know, but I, it, it, was, it was hard. It was, there was no doubt about it. But I think, you know, you got to pick yourself up and figure out the next steps and make it better and keep it from happening again in the future. How could the world's largest airline that was uh, perceived to be so strong, uh, whose employee cafeteria had a grand piano and a, and a piano player and a tuxedo playing music during lunch, how could all of that um, be ripped away so quickly? And, and I mean that because when we slipped into bankruptcy, it happened so quickly. Um, departments were decimated. Um, the, the layoffs that occurred from the union perspective, the furloughs that we had to do, we had to do and, and go through. And um, it, it was just uh, a tough time. I did go back to work the very next day. Um, I was scheduled um, for the desk that actually had the flights, uh, flight 175 and 93. I was actually on that, that desk the very next day. Um, there was nothing to be done with the, 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 the everything down, but I remember logging into the computer and there were still some messages um, in the flight list queued up from the day before. And so it was still kind of the, the Flight 93 um, monitoring record was still there in the queue. And so we just go in to clear the messages as they're sitting there and there's one of them, you know. And so even just seeing the flight number with just its scheduled route of flight was, you know, definitely, you know, just cuts right through you at that moment. Uh, I was scheduled to work the next day and uh, not, uh, not knowing what the future would hold, right? Are we going to fly today or what? Um, I went to bed that night, got up in the morning, same as the day before, same weather, you know, crystal blue sky, dry, you know, here in the Chicago land area, it was real, humidity was low, it was just a beautiful day. And I walked out to my car, and you know, you did. It, it hit me that I didn't hear the noise from the airport, and I didn't smell the faint odor of you know exhaust or spent jet fuel in the air. I think we're dispatchers are so strong sometimes that we just absorb it all. But there are probably times where you can only absorb so much. And I think that was a day for a lot of us, no matter where you, worked, where you were, which airline you worked for. Yeah, I was proud of everybody that day. Um, I, I thought everybody did a phenomenal job, really. Um, you know, the guys that were in, in the bunker I was in, there was, there was focus. Um, there wasn't, um, it wasn't like it was chaotic at all. It was just kind of a focused effort to... You know, do the, the main three things were figuring out what you have in the air, communicating with them, and getting them on the ground safely. I'm immensely proud of the United Airlines dispatchers that were working that day. Each and every one of them were able to overcome personal 
emotions, experience levels that did not dictate that they would be able to do the kind of thing that they did, they performed at a very, very high level, provided very good communications and excellent support of our flight crews. What we learned, I think, that day was that you're never going to be able to forecast what's going to happen next. Oh, I really pray this never happens again. Um, I believe there'll probably be something catastrophic happen again. I'm, I don't think it'll necessarily be done the same way with, air, with air, airplanes. Not to say that the TSA has made us all safer necessarily, but I think there have been some enough safety measures that have been taken into account. I would like to, in my heart of hearts, believe it won't. I think the challenge is, is that we never thought 9-11 would happen in the first place. So the next step, you know, there potentially is a threat, and I don't know what that is, but I believe that, you know, there's... There's attempts at doing harm to the institution. All things were perfect for them. They, had, they were holding all the cards. And I don't see that we could have done anything differently. And on my end, I, don't, I can't speak for the crews. Bless their hearts. I, I'm, I'm sure people agonize over that every day. Um, but I, I'm proud of the job that I do, and I wish I could have done something more for them. We can't tell what the next big thing is going to be. And, you know, um, airlines are a romantic target. And, and we're always going to be at risk by, just by virtue of being what we are. 9-11, without a doubt, was simply the worst day of my life. Uh, nothing comes close to that. Uh, I've never felt so helpless, so empty. You know, I'm glad I was on, I'm glad I was working that day because for me, 9-11, um, it validated in every reason for the dispatcher to be in the position. It was the day that defined dispatchers to me. We were conveying flight safety critical information to those flights from all over the country and getting planes on the ground and um, I don't think there was a better example of what the work that we do than that day um, every day there's amazing work that gets done but that day purely defined what a dispatcher is their value to the aviation community their value their value their value to uh, you know, the aviation infrastructure, and so there was a part of me that was proud to be there, there's proud to, to, to be there with the teammates that I was at with United. Um, it, there was, you know, I don't ever look back on that and regret being in that office that day, ever. We're all working together, whether we're union, management, senior management, or just the janitor, we're all doing what we can to do the best for our airline at that point in time. We throw aside our differences. We throw aside any rancor or mistrust that we may have. And I saw everyone involved doing the absolute best that they could at that period of time. So that afternoon, uh, when I got home uh, and I sat down and watch the news to recap the whole day. My daughter, who was about four years old at the time, she sat next to me on the couch and as she was watching the images on TV, she was trying to process why would anyone fly an airliner into a building and kill all those people. And I remember she asked me, Daddy, why did those people, why did those pilots fly those airplanes into the building? And trying to keep things as simple as possible, uh, I remember I told her, I said, Mary, there were some very bad people flying those, those airplanes. And she looked up.
And she asked me, are those pilots going to be fired? And it was, uh, I think it was just a new chapter that was being opened in all of our lives that day. I continue to think about moving forward and the lessons learned and what it is that we do today and how we react to situations and taking care of everybody that we can uh, because one day it could be your family and you want that dispatcher to take care of them the way you would because you must always remember to never forget. We will always remember to never forget. We must always remember to never forget. We must always remember to never forget. We must always remember to never forget.